Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vijay Samuel, and uh, I'm the architect of the observability platform at eBay. Hello, I'm Nick Fordash, and I'm the lead engineer of the observability platform at eBay. Uh, we're going to spend the next uh, few minutes uh, talking about how we use uh, continuous profiling in our production environments to monitor um, our observability platform, uh, which are mostly comprised of uh, Kubernetes deployments. That said, uh, uh, let's spend a few minutes uh, knowing what uh, the pillars of observability are, uh, what is uh, continuous profiling specifically in that, um, what is the architecture that we use today to do continuous profiling, some examples on um, how we are uh, benefiting from uh, uh, the usage of continuous profiling with real, real world uh, optimizations that we have done and the savings that we see in that. Uh, we'll do a quick demo and then talk about uh, the potential that we see with continuous profiling, given that it's a very uh, new space uh, in, in observability uh, and how it can evolve in the long run. So that said, uh, we are uh, used to talking about uh, the three pillars of observability, uh, which are uh, logs. Logs can be uh, structured or unstructured. Uh, depending on nomenclature, you could even split this pillar into two pillars uh, between logs and events. Uh, but typically, they are uh, strings uh, that are generated uh, by uh, uh, loggers like uh, SLF4J or the ZAP, uh, yeah, written into a file or uh, written out uh, through uh, TCP, gRPC, or HTTP. Uh, we have metrics. Uh, which is uh, continuous uh, time series data. Uh, any measure that you have in the system that you want to emit periodically or expose, um, you typically go for metrics. Uh, some common examples are CPU usage, uh, the number of requests that uh, you're encountering, or uh, uh, the latency profile that you see uh, for, a, for, a, for a given request. Uh, tracing uh, allows you to have a record of uh, the request execution through massively distributed systems. So um, if uh, you have a user interface that's making a bunch of uh, API calls, um, how the request flow navigates through all the microservices, you should be able to elegantly see uh, if you are using uh, distributed tracing across all the microservices that are of interest. And the final one, uh, which is uh, the new kid on the block, is basically profiles. Uh, profiles go all the way down to the code level consumption numbers. Uh, so you can see uh, how much uh, CPU you are spending or uh, how much memory is being used uh, at each and every uh, 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 method level. And uh, uh, it basically gives you an idea of how the program behaves over a period of time uh, or across various uh, uh, functions that are involved. So what is a profile? Uh, profiles provide uh, performance metrics at the most granular level possible. Um, historically, they have been viewed as uh, very expensive because uh, uh, what are called trace level uh, profilers, they, they collect very granular information and the way that they collect them is, uh, is uh, typically very expensive. So you cannot keep running them all the time uh, because the application would degrade in performance substantially. Uh, and there are various types of uh, profiles that you can take. Uh, you can do a CPU profile or a heap profile, mutex, IO, GPU, and then there may be uh, different kind of profiles that are very specific to a language. So uh, uh, Go is a good example for that, where you have a, a Go routine profile as well, uh, with which you can analyze all the Go routines that are being spawned by a given program. And uh, uh, you get the information of uh, why a, a certain part of the server resources are being consumed, uh, and you can get a lot of uh, uh, statistics uh, down to the line number of your program. Continuous profiling uh, is a concept where uh, you take an action and over a period of time, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so uh, uh, recently, with the advent of uh, sampling profilers, um, doing uh, the uh, the profiling itself has become a lot cheaper. 
uh, what basically does is that for, for, uh, for a certain granularity, you keep picking samples uh, of information that you uh, care about. And that information over a period of time can be viewed. You can aggregate it uh, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can trend it and do many things with that. So there are several products that uh, uh, products or projects that allow us to do that. Uh, some of them uh, are Pyroscope, uh, CNC, CNCF has something called Pixie, there's Parka, and uh, uh, profiles are catching up to a, uh, a certain level that uh, even Open Telemetry has its own um, working group that uh, is uh, bringing profile as a standard into the uh, into the Open Telemetry project. Uh, profiles can, uh, in the in the context of continuous profiling, can be uh, collected either through scraping, uh, which uh, mo uh, people who are familiar with Golang, uh, Golang has the concept of pprof. Uh, a pprof HTTP endpoint can be periodically polled uh, to be able to find uh, all the uh, uh, periodically collect all the samples um, for that given application. The other way is to be able to push where. Uh, you have a standard client that either an open source project or a vendor project, uh, vendor product uh, ships out. You add a few lines of boilerplate code into your application, um, uh, announcing which endpoint the, the profiles need to be published into, and the application will periodically push uh, samples into the backend. And the final one is uh, instrumentation, the instrumentation free approach, where you use something like eBPF. Uh, where a module is loaded into the kernel, uh, and uh, that is responsible for extracting all the uh, the profiles out. So, how did we go about doing this? Um, we we looked at various uh, uh, open source projects, and uh, we landed on uh, uh, Pyroscope as one of them. Uh, uh, it was a, it was relatively easy to set up. It had a very nice uh, user experience for us to visualize. Uh, uh, profiling data and it also has some uh, nifty features where you can do side by side view uh, look at the difference uh, uh, between uh, various profiles and even uh, upload ad hoc profiles to to see it using their user experience uh, initially we started it as an experiment where we used our uh, uh, pre-production environment to do some load and performance uh, analysis where uh, we had Pyroscope uh, deployed in, in the pre-production namespace, um, let it run against uh, our uh, metrics platform uh, so that any new build that we are uh, considering to release, we could uh, gain some insights uh, from a profiling perspective. Uh, we saw good amount of success to the point where now we are deploying it on our production namespaces as well. Um, so that uh, if there is an incident, uh, the profiles are already there for us too. Uh, uh, view at a later point in time. So right now what we do is we, uh, given that uh, Pyroscope uses the uh, Prometheus uh, service discovery, we uh, we add an pod annotations on all the uh, deployments or stateful sets that we are interested in uh, collecting profiles and we set it uh, to a 10-second uh, 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 polling period. So um, as Vijay was saying, with the, the, our current uh, deployment architecture for this, it's nothing um, fancy. Uh, you know, the primary motivator, as Vijay touched on a bit, was that, um, you know, uh, we we were looking at continuous profiling kind of from two uh, perspectives um, for me, which was uh, we want to have profiling data available in the event that we need to do active triaging for something that requires it, because a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes metrics or like logs does not really show us what we need. Um, another one is that um, when you run uh, systems at high scale, you're always looking for places to kind of save costs and have things run cheaper. And having profiles simply on hand whenever you want them makes it a lot easier for any engineer to kind of just go in whenever they have some free time and just start poking around. Um, and maybe you catch things if you're lucky. Um, so our setup is... Uh, like I say, it's simple. We basically have multiple Kubernetes clusters internally, and we have different namespaces for our different, um, you know, observability uh, offerings. 
And we just deploy a pyroscope into each one of those namespaces in that cluster to do the, the scraping and things like that. Um, there's no requirement for us at the moment to do any type of querying across them or anything like that. So it's a very just vanilla just deployment configured to uh, scrape whatever is locally based on whatever the annotations are set on uh, the pod specs and we're good to go. We just have the the uh, profiling data available whenever we, we need it. Um, next slide, EJ. So um, some typical questions just to get out of the way. Um, so as Vijay was saying, you know, historically profiling has been considered somewhat expensive, and this is probably debatable depending on the runtime that you're on. Um, at least for us, our stack is primarily Golang, um, and it's incredibly cheap um, in the sense that, you know, even pulling every 10 seconds, we don't really notice anything. Like if there's any CPU consumption going on with any of our services, it's lost in the, in the signal noise, uh, and we can't even really tell. I know there are some exceptions with this, um, depending on the the runtime that you're on, um, things like that, and like like lock and mutex uh, profiling can have impacts, and you have to be kind of careful with things like that. But generally speaking, it's easy enough to just keep it on indefinitely. Um, in terms of like storage uh, for profiles, this is where um, we've had some of I think the most trouble, so to speak, um, in the sense that um, they're surprisingly large, <laughs> uh, depending on how many pods you have um, deployed into our namespace with the setup that we have. Um, so we've had to kind of aggressively um, uh, have the tiering um, aggregation set up on Pyroscope to where we don't keep 10 second profiles around for very long because we just run out of disk space on a single uh, Pyroscope pod. Um, so that, that seems to be the largest challenge at the moment. Um, and then we just rely on like longer sampled uh, data. Um, and then uh, of course the question is, did we find any any benefit out of this as opposed to, for example, just you know going and doing ad hoc you know uh, profiling, hitting a pprof endpoint using the go tool chain to look at things and stuff like that. And the answer is yes because which which we'll get into with a couple examples here. Uh, so the first one, um, so this was an interesting uh, example in that, um, like I was saying, because of how convenient it was that the profiles were just uh, readily available, this was something that I noticed in the morning, just having coffee, like looking at email and then just poking around profiles because I was curious. Um, so this is from one of our um, uh, ingestion services. And uh, what's uh, with the picture at the bottom, um, this is CPU, CPU profile, we can see that the the top uh, contender for the the CPU usage was uh, an internal uh, method for the Go runtime um, called Map Iter Next, um, and based on the call stack, this is coming from a part of the code that's effectively delete like resetting a map state, so clearing it because we want to reuse the memory. Um, and it was quite surprising to see uh, this uh, in uh, in in the profile showing up. Um, because for those that are uh, maybe unaware of some of the, the, the Golang internals and optimizations that it does, um, the, the, the code that we see in the context where it says 4K uh, over range deletes uh, the, the uh, key from a map, um, that's the idiomatic way in Go to basically delete everything out of a map. And uh, at, you know, at uh, first sight, it seems wildly inefficient as opposed to other languages like on the JVM where you might have like a clear or a truncate method or something like that. However, the Go runtime is smart enough to see this and it actually optimizes it to not iterate over the map and it calls something called um, uh, map clear instead. Um, so the question came up, why is map clear not being called here, uh, which should make this not show up in the profile? Um, why is it calling map iter next? Um, so that's what we need to figure out by based on this. Uh, next slide, PJ. So um, because of the nature of this problem, um, there was no easy way to, uh, at least I could think of, to, to figure this out without dropping into some assembly. Um, so the first step was, well, we can compile the source file uh, that uh, uh, for this code uh, the, that the map being deleted and see what the compiler's telling us that it's doing. And we can see that the compiler actually says that it's going to create a call to runtime map clear. So the question is, why is it not showing up like that in the profile? 
So the next step was, okay, well, maybe something else is going on. So we'll, we'll, we'll compile um, uh, a source file that calls that instead of just the source file itself um, and see if there's a difference. And we can see in this case, instead of saying map clear for the same line of code, it's saying map iter next now. Um, so the, the particular function where we're resetting the map is small enough that it was probably being inlined by the compiler. So the question was, well, is for some reason um, code inlining, like making this optimization not happen? So that was an experiment to try out. So we that you can see a PR diff um, in the picture where we just said, okay, we're just not gonna inline this particular method and see if the problem goes away. Um, so then as some initial validation, um, we check the, the initial source file and make sure that it's still calling runtime map clear after we added the, the no inline uh, annotation. And then we do the same check on another source file that's calling it. And we can see that um, now it's, not making any reference to runtime anything, it's just making a reference to that method um, since we're not inlining anymore. So that means that it should be getting, it should be a runtime map clear now. Um, and after deploying the change, we can see that um, runtime map clear is being, uh, is in that call stack now instead of map iter next. So um, the, the, uh, interesting thing about this particular problem is, is how nuanced is it was. Um, given that it was the top CPU contender on this service, it actually saved us 12% CPU for something that was so silly in a sense. Okay, and then another example, which is uh, memory related. Um, so in this uh, particular case, um, this uh, was the result of uh, myself doing some premature uh, optimization that uh, we caught after the fact. Um, so I was, at the time I was in the uh, habit, we were rewriting a lot of our um, kind of internal APIs and the majority, a large majority of our API calls uh, highly benefit from uh, various types of memory pooling and things like that. Um, and so for this particular service and this API call, um, I just made blindly made the same assumption and kind of just rolled forward with it. Um, but what we can see is um, with the this diff of um, kind of a an older version of the service and a newer one is on the left side. Um, there's a the majority of the heap memory is being taken up by one particular method, and this method just really manages a a, a memory buffer for kind of um, receiving a, a updating updated a, a RPC calls and things like that. Um, and in hindsight, for some context, uh, it was a case to where, well, upon startup and getting um, uh, uh, responses from a particular uh, upstream service, the buffer might be really big um, initially, and then we would never see that much data come over again. You'd get these tiny incremental updates. So it was probably a huge waste to have that whole thing pooled. Um, so on the right side, we can see, well, like, well if we just remove the pooling, what happens? And we can see that by removing that pooling, we were able to reduce the memory by roughly 50%. And then just for some additional validation, we had uh, three deployments of this going. Um, the, um, the ones in, uh, on, the, on the, uh, the memory side of the graph, we can see cluster 134 and 137 are running the old version that was doing the pooling. And then 129 was running the new one without the pooling. And we see the memory, and again, at least it, even from the metrics is showing that roughly half of the memory is being used. And then just for some additional, um, to see if there's any CPU impact on the right side, we said that there, there's no notable uh, CPU impact. So this was a clear case of this is like, we had a buffer for no good reason that was actually ended up doing us some harm. Uh Given that we see, we see good benefit, uh, we also wanted to do a quick demo uh, for people to be aware of how to use these profilers. So that being said, let me uh, move to my terminal. Uh, what I've done is uh, I've, I've, I've cloned the, the Pyroscope uh, repository on my local, and uh, they have some good examples on uh, 
uh, how you can uh, do profiling against various languages and whatnot. Uh, so I picked the easy one, uh, which we are very familiar with. Uh, I picked the Go example. Uh, so they have a, a Docker Compose file where uh, they're using the Golang hot rod, uh, which is a very common uh, uh, playground app that is built to demonstrate various uh, observability functions like uh, metrics, logs, and uh, traces. Uh, along with it, uh, Pyroscope uh, is also deployed and uh, Jaeger is deployed as well so that uh, you can see um, you, you use the hot rod app, it shows you sample traces, um, navigate to the traces and uh, in turn for this demo specifically, we, we show the usage of Pyroscope. Um, so I already have uh, these uh, containers running so that uh, there is some amount of uh, profiles that are already built. Um, back to the browser. So I go to localhost 8080, where I can see the hot rod application that's there. Uh, I'll make some sample API calls to generate some amount of traffic. Uh, this application in itself, you could use it to use the Jaeger UI and uh, look at the distributed traces. But let's go to the Pyroscope UI, uh, which is on 4040. Uh, so when you come into the UI, uh, it gives you the ability to um, apply certain tags and also look at a bunch of applications that are there. Uh, so by default, Pyroscope is uh, being profiled by itself. Um, we can see the uh, hot rod application that's there and all the profiles that are being collected for it. Uh, CPU, go routines, uh, and then the objects that uh, um, uh, are being see, have been uh, seen by the profiler, the allocations um, and the in-use objects along with the space. Uh, so you can you can pick one of them. Uh, there is a, a time picker where uh, you can uh, select the time and uh, uh, you can see some, uh, you can see the profile for, for that during this time period, how much time is spent on uh, uh, various uh, uh, methods that are there. Uh, uh, you can uh, view it both in a tabular view uh, and also in a, a flame graph, which is uh, what we typically are used to if we uh, talk about profiles. Uh, there is uh, the option for doing ad hoc profiling where uh, you can uh, um, upload the pprofs. Uh, you can either do a, a, a single view or a comparison diff view. Uh, we'll take a look at that next. Uh, but uh, uh, this allows for being able to uh, do, uh, do profiling without uh, having to actually continuous profile. You can always uh, do it uh, ad hoc as well. Um, let's go to the comparison view next. Uh, so the comparison view allows you to either compare uh, two different um, instances or um, even the same instance, but different uh, time periods. Um, a typical use case for this would be, um, I have a known good build that's running. I have a canary that, uh, that uh, was deployed as part of a new rollout. The canary is not behaving well. Um, so uh, how do I look at uh, what is the difference between uh, both builds? Or a certain period, there was an issue that happened uh, between steady state and during the issue. Uh, how do I know what was uh, going on that was different compared to the normal? Uh, so we do the same thing here. Uh, let's. Uh, pick an instance, uh, given that I only have one. Um, we can do a timeline diff where, uh, let me pick one here. And uh, I think this was the time when um, I ran a few API calls. So now you have a side-by-side -side view of, uh, uh, of the flame graphs. The bottom, you have a side-by-side -side view of uh, the, the tabular view. Uh, and basically it gives you the opportunity to 
um, analyze what was going on at that point in time. Uh, the diff view uh, basically shows you um, any differences. So in this case, uh, you can see more time being spent on uh, serving HTTP calls because obviously we made a few HTTP calls at that at that point in time. Uh, 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 more than the user experience of a given project or product, I think uh, the, the important part is that uh, we have the ability uh, to be able to collect all these profiles and uh, uh, store them in a place where we can come back to at any point in time um, and be able to view them as, uh, as necessary. Uh, so that being said, uh, let's go back to the slides. What is the potential that we see in all of this? Um, for, first and foremost, uh, uh, one of the harder things to observe uh, when you are deploying things at scale, uh, uh, it's very e easy to monitor a rollout, um, identify if KPIs or golden signals are going out of the ordinary um, alert rollback and things like that. Um, but what about slow bleeds, like uh, memory leaks that are progressing over a period of time? Um, a profile makes it very easy to analyze uh, these kinds of uh, uh, slow bleeds that are there. Uh, but you could also have uh, detection mechanisms that are put in place where you detect such a scenario and uh, maybe you roll back uh, to the last uh, stable build and this also, and uh, you can, uh, given that you can view uh, profiles across various time periods, it also gives you the opportunity to compare, okay, where exactly do you think that uh, the memory leak may be and things like that. Uh, so three-click RCA. So uh, an RCA is a root cause analysis um, with the, the concept of exemplars uh, in metrics. It is now possible for us to say, start from an alert, uh, view a metric, um, click on an exemplar that's there on a metric, and then you can go to a trace. And then from a trace, uh, you can go to uh, logs. So that's typically what's uh, dubbed as a three-click RCA. But with the advent of profiles, you could even say take it a step further to say that uh, uh, when you're on the trace, as long as the uh, trace has... Uh, a reference to a profile, uh, you can go from alert to metric to trace to profile. And then you can start observing what things are happening um, at a method level. Um, so uh, this should, in theory, help uh, drive reduction in the time to triage. Uh, and the final one, uh, which we felt the most value in our uh, uh, limited but uh, powerful way of uh, using uh, continuous profiling uh, is to see continuous cost savings. Uh, whenever we uh, write new code or even just sit with a cup of coffee and look at how things are uh, behaving on our production environment, it give the, these profiles give us the opportunity uh, to really get down and optimize, uh, optimize the code. Uh, and this means that we are going to reduce the amount of CPU and memory we are uh, utilizing. Uh, and uh, uh, in turn, we are not wasting uh, resources. So that being said, uh, we are happy to take questions offline. Uh, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you.